You may wish to adjust the dial. You are currently tuned into the wrong station. Chapter 1. A Prelude By the ruins of Chitamalfi, city of witches, city of harlotries and sin, there stands a pool where the belladonna grows. Its name is the Lagos Venicia, and though it has been known since ancient times, its older names are lost. In the distant past, the Sibyls of Tyrrheni would drink from it just once, in hours of monumental crisis, they would drink of its water and prophesy and die. And long thereafter, Queen Alpana seduced Vittorio of Samni by the water's cool and purple-flowered shores, and for a time, during the Golden Age, its waters ran completely dry, for in lesser doses they became known as a cosmetic and love tincture of high esteem. But this, of course, caused many beauties of the noble caste to die, with their limbs folded up like insects dry upon the window sill, and the pool was afterwards forgotten, except to those who lived beside it. But until not so long ago, the girls of Chitamalfi would come to the waters on their wedding nights and wash their faces with its beautifying touch. They became renowned for their beauty for their rose-touched cheeks and wide, dark eyes. But beauty and strangeness are the midwives of suspicion, and empty Chitamalfi has no daughters left. Chapter 2 The Maestro's Emissary In the estimation of Maestro Chilcini of Tortinevra, the greatest artist in the world was Maestro Chilcini of Tortenevra. His passion of St. Pierculo attracted thousands to the city each year, simply to gape, wet-lipped upon its vision of religious ecstasy. It was rumored that an early portrait he had painted of the Contessa di Balbino had been of such intimate quality that it had killed two men by heart attack. An artist must be a lion. He would roar as he waddled amongst his apprentices, slump-shouldered but right of eye. And though there was little Leonin about the patchy white baldness beneath his brassard cap, prelates and patricians alike would brush the cobblestones with their long sleeves as he passed along the long geometric streets of Tortenevra. Of the maestro's many apprentices, the greatest was a young man named Dul Camara. He was very tall and dark, and he smiled all the time. His gaze unsettled some people. The wide and staring pupils seemed too intent, too interested. And yet he had a certain following of admirers and confidants among the painted dowagers and damsels of the city's upper crust. He could draw a hundred identical circles freehand in under two minutes, and more impressive still, during the last bout of daggers drawn that had erupted among Tortenevra's towers, he had cut the throat of the great Massimo Thrassi in an alley behind the cathedral. If it strikes you as odd that a painter's apprentice should be measured by his ability to cut throats, then you understand neither Tortenevra nor the world of arts. But let us begin. It was in the maestro's studio all lit up golden and dark with the golden hour light that streamed through its wide arched window, 
that the maestro asked Dul Kemara to kill a man for what would be the final time. Of course, maestro, the apprentice replied. Shall it be the dagger or the poisoned chalice? You must not think less of him for this. In Tortenevra, a baker's apprentice would stab his master's rival through the eye. A Luther's boy would choke a rival Luther with a gittern string. Neither, Dulcamara. For this task, we must employ weapons of more subtle design. The Maester von Grotland. You know of him? I know he is your enemy, Maestro. Is he the man I am to kill? To young men of Dulcamara's class, a Maestro was more than a father. Unlike a father, a Maestro could provide. My sources tell me he will be revealing a great work at the Cathedral of Morifirmi in one month's time. The painting stolen. It is not his work. How do you know this, Maestro? Because the Maester von Grotlin is a fraud! The Maestro screamed, flinging down his brush and knocking wooden models to the floor. Dulcamaro did not react. Accustomed to his master's outbursts, he calmly took the scene through eyes like spreading pools of ink. I do not know how he has done it, the maestro seethed, pacing his studio like a chained tiger. That is for you, my dark pupil, to bring to light. But I know he does not have a great work in him. Go, you. Tomorrow fear me to destroy him, Dulcamara. And if you fail, do not come back. To gain access to the Maester's atelier in Morifirmi, Dulcimara was forced to climb three stories with a dagger in his teeth, its blade already bloodied by the red sliver of moonlight which hung against an umber sky. Once inside, he crept past ranks of sleeping apprentices, and the knife was heavy with potential in his hand. At a moment, he could bring it down to end a life in swift and brutal silence. But he had no cause. No prentice waked, for all were pale from overwork and dark beneath the eyes from lack of sleep. He did not have to look far for the supposed masterwork. When he came into the studio, it was waiting for him at the farther end, a faceless vastness beneath the gray draping cloths that hid it from the dangers of the world. It was a presence. It watched him, silent as he approached, his footsteps soft on leathern soles. The cloth beneath his hand was soft as doubt, and at his merest touch it slithered, rippling to the floor. At the sight of the work beneath it, Dulcimara's pupils spread, allowing what dim light there was to filter down and dampen dark recesses in his brain, and soon it seemed his eyes were almost black, so the subtlest brush strokes were clear to him as silver in the dark. He knew this work, and at the sight of it his body twisted with powerful emotions that he had not felt in many years. But then a footstep sounded in the hall, and a moment later, when a tired-eyed pupil stumbled past the open door to dump the chamber pot they all together shared, the studio was empty, and the work was masked once more. The day came, and with pomp and magisterial effect, the Maester von Grotland and his apprentices arrived before the broad steps of the Cathedral di Morifirmi. Behind them came a cart pulled by white oxen, and atop it, the masterwork, in its vast swaddlings of lamb's wool and crisp straw. The cardinal and prelates were there, as were members of each great family of Morifirmi, the Barathi, the Mastigia, the Uccisori, and the Fraditores, as well as a half-dozen other houses of velvet and satin, of pendants golden and of yellow smiles. A crowd of the popolo minuto, the common folk, had gathered there as well. In Morifimi, high and low alike took interest in matters pertinent to God and art. Praise God, who has so inspired the humble hand of his servant with such divine talents, 
began the maester, as his apprentices set up the great work on its easel. Who saw fit to fill this meager eye of mine with sight to see his glory, and to pluck from the mind of mere and mortal man so great a thought as to be worthy of his praise, and that, he continued in this vein for several minutes, before Dulcemara deemed the time had come to interrupt. This he accomplished without shouts or exclamations. Merely he strode from the crowd, saturnine and smiling, footsteps whispering against the stairs of polished tavertine as startled silence fell. Arriving by the maester, he turned his back upon the man in order to bow before the cardinal and city lords. The audacity, the disrespect of this gesture gave him command over the crowd. For a long moment, Dulcimara drank in the attention, holding the silence for as long as it would stretch before snapping. A flight of blackbirds cast purple reflections against the city's stones. My lords, forgive me, he declaimed at last, ignoring the strangled apoplexy of Van Grotland from behind him. I am called Dulcemara. Maestro Kilsini sends me here from Tortenevra to inform you of a fraud this man attempts against you. Finding his voice, Van Grotland drew breath to protest, but the cardinal, well known for his cold eyes and the dried blood beneath his fingernails, silenced the maester with a gesture. Do go on, young Dolkemara, the cardinal said. There was a chill amusement in his grey, unblinking eyes. I know your master to be motivated by nothing, nothing save the highest callings of art. This painting, your eminence, said Dulcimara, with a second bow to the cardinal, is undoubtedly a masterwork. He sidestepped to Van Grotland and drew the painting's veil aside. Gasps of astonishment rose from the crowd. From the first glance, it was a work of startling, unsettled vision. The scene was of the temptation of St. Chinidius, and it showed Chinidius himself, cowering in the desert, one clawed hand reached up toward the heaven where a dim light shone, and all around him on every side demons teemed and swarmed in the gathering shadows, light flashing from the bared teeth between their purple tinctured lips, light flashing from the darkness of their wide, dilated eyes. But... By some trick of the brush, the focus, while clear beneath the dingy light of heaven, grew blurred increasingly toward the edges, as though the scene were viewed through watering, dilated eyes. But Dolcamara's clear voice broke through the reverie. He did not paint it. Then from whence did it originate? said Ludovica Barathi, one of the city's high nobles. She asked, not out of skepticism, but out of a leering cruelty toward the maester. There is no better pleasure in this world than watching the prideful fall. She was setting Dulcimara up, and her chapped lips wore a vicious smile. It was stolen, Dulcimara said, from the workshop of Maestro Solana, during the sack of Cheetah Malfi. A new silence fell, a silence tinged by guilt. How many in Morfirmi had stole some trinket from the ruin of that city? How many in Tortinevra, Krukativa, or Prigio? So many had taken trophies of their crime. And why should the maester have been any better than they? That is absurd! Van Grotland blustered. That was more than twenty years ago. Why should I wait till now to unveil a stolen work? Where is your proof? You waited until you were an old man, Dulcimara said, till those who knew Solana or his work would all forget or die. But unlucky for you, Maestro Kilsini. He does neither. At a clap of his hands, a pair of Kilsini's junior apprentices emerged from the crowd, bearing between them a black portfolio case. Sketches, Dulcimara said, as the black case opened. 
from Solana's hand itself, a gift to Maestro Kilsini long ago. And, indeed, the sheaves of vellum bore the same images from the same hand that had later been transfigured on the canvas frame. Now all eyes turned to look upon the maester. Van Grotland's face had drained from red to white, and now, a look of horror corpse-like on his features, he turned from the world of cardinals and princelings and staggered down the church steps. The crowd parted around him as he staggered through, and a strange, half-human keening lifted from his throat as he rent his clothes with cracking fingernails and bloodied fingertips. And after that he vanished, howling through the city's hollow streets. Never again was he seen, either within or without the wine-stained walls of Morifirmi. Upon Dulcimara's return, Maestro Kilsini was rubicund with joy. He slapped a messy kiss upon the young man's cheek and laughed, his triumph bouncing from the towers of Tortenevra through the darkest hours of the night. Belladonna, Maestro said, pouring Dulcimara a glass of finest ancient wine. That's what they said he drank to end his life. Ah! But others disagree. They tell me, Maestro, it was nightshade that he drank. <laughs> Fools, they are the same herb. Are they indeed, Maestro? The apprentice said. Even so, Dulcimara. Also, Baneswort, Devil's Cherry, Black Fruit, too. You must learn such things, my child. A great painter must know his pigments. A greater one must know his poisons. <laughs> He chortled into his cup, making a purple froth upon the surface of his wine. So it was the poisoned chalice after all, eh? Mm. But by his own hand, not yours. Most devious, my Dulcimara, and most very subtle. He trailed off a moment. They were seated by the wide arch of a window, and the dim lights of Tortenevra were shining in the maestro's wine-dilated eyes. Dark towers filled with rare, dark golden lights, and set against a skyline dark as purple flowers touched with blight. A question occurred to him. Uh, sketches, Dulcimara, he asked, suddenly thoughtful. Where did you find them? The young man laughed. Then, draining his goblet, he grinned that unsettling, staring grin at his master, with the wine still purpling his teeth. A riddle for you, maestro. Two versions of the truth. A, a riddle? <laughs> a frazzle worthy of my intellect. Then tell me, Dulcimara, and, and I shall guess. One, I stole them from the maester, but he could not accuse me of this without admitting he had them in the first place, which would mean that the painting was a fraud. Aha, uh -huh. so that's one version, and I'll say it has the ring of truth. It has your cleverness, Dulcimara. And the second? Dulcimara's smile widened, his purple lips as dark as his eyes were bright. That I stole them from you, maestro. That you yourself took them from Cheetah Malfi in the sack. Nonsense, I would remember. Would you? And all of a sudden, in his mind, Kilsini was back at the fall of Cheetah Malfi, under a sky reflecting back the redness of the flames, and the screams, and the smell of flesh, and he was sprinting up the steps with a sword in one hand and a bag of silver at his hip, and then crashing through the door, Solana lying crumpled by his easel with an arrow in his throat and shouts behind him. More were coming, and woe to the looter looted by his own side. And so he rushed through the studio, cramming fistfuls of parchment into his bags, not caring what he ruined so long as he had them, got them, and got out, before any in the chaos got to him and robbed them first. Back in the moment, his face fell, and then, with astonishment, he looked back up at his pupil. No, he said. Surely I would have remembered. A work of Solana's. 
surely. And then he threw his head back and roared with laughter. Master and pupil, their laughter peeled together from the window, filling Tordenevra's hazy night. So, which was it really? Kilsini said. The dagger or the poison chalice? Which version was the truth? Dulcimara merely smiled. Maybe neither. Maybe both. Chapter 3 The Masterwork of Dulcimara All of Dulcimara's time was not spent murdering his maestro's rivals. Indeed, the majority of his apprenticeship was spent gathering pigments, mixing paints, preparing canvases for Kilsini. Now that he was a senior apprentice, he was permitted to do the maestro's work on his behalf, filling backgrounds or performing small commissions in the master's style. At the time, this was not considered fraud. The apprentice himself was one of the maestro's works, and so his work was the maestro's work as well, by property of emanation. In what few hours he had remaining in a day, the apprentice was free to practice his own craft. Little by little, during short, dark hours after the maestro's work was finished, and before he collapsed onto his own meager cot, Dulcimara toiled on his masterwork. A masterwork was not the same as a great work. Many masters produced only minor works. Van Grotlin certainly had been such a one, and there were detractors who said the same of Kilsini. No, a masterwork was simply that, a work which would earn Dulcimara recognition as a master, worthy of opening his own studio, of leaving Kilsini behind, ending the exploitation of his own work, and beginning to exploit the work of others. Of course, no maestro wished to lose a worker, and so each apprentice had to acquire pigments, canvas, brushes of their own. These items were expensive, and so, at first, most of an apprentice's rare, spare hours had to be spent making money, by taking small commissions, or blending up cosmetics, or by prostitution to some appalling widow, some leering noble pederast. Dokemara, though, was lucky in his knowledge. He knew how to brew a certain tincture, an eye drop popular with noble ladies that enlarged the user's pupils, giving a doe-eyed, fawning look which the city's wealthy men found irresistible. It also imparted a certain blush to the cheeks, and its mild, stimulant effect caused the heart to beat rapidly enough that a suitor could feel its excitement if they slid a hand between the lady's breasts. Dulcimara enjoyed a certain monopoly over this tincture. Others could make it, but not as safely, and if done wrong, the drops induced slurred speech, fugue states, and diabolic visions. Even death. And so, despite meager funds and materials, Dulcimara's masterwork unfolded slowly, week upon week, month upon month. When it was nearly finished, one of the other apprentices told Kilsini, after sending Dulcimara out upon some errand, the maestro crept in upon his painting. Trembling, trembling was the heart within Kilsini's breast, Greatness is a golden millstone around a great man's neck, priceless to have, heavy to bear, uncountenanceable to lose. A vast canvas shrouded amidst grey cloth, with hard, gnarled hands the maestro brushed his fingertips across the fabric, before tightening his grip and ripping it aside. From the narrow window, sunlight slashed across the canvas. The maestro stared, wide-eyed, dry-mouthed, and then, feeble at the knees, he sank to a crouch on the hard edge of Dulcimara's cot. He knew the painting's scene. It was a rendition of The Fall of Irileone, but he had never seen its like, its particular blend of crisp, horrendous realism with grotesque, fantastical bedlam. There were no godlike conquerors here, no doomed heroes dying in their home's defense. Two minor characters took the stage, 
each worth no more than line in the myths of old. Siamata and Atiazi, a young mother and son, she, in her purple robes, pierced through with arrows in her side, facing away from the painting's viewer, dying as she watched her city die. He, half turned toward the viewer, hand and crimsoned with his dying mother's blood, and, from any angle which you viewed the canvas, you could not escape the look of hurt and wonder on his face. Beyond these two, red-lit murder ran amok, children smashed, boys and women violated, old men kneeling to the blade, each crime, sin, trespass rendered in a detail born, it seemed, of love. But outside the clarity illuminated by an incandescing city, the edges of the painting blurred and swam into a delirious outer darkness, writhing with aberrations that pulsed, half seen like motes of dried blood floating in the corner of an eye. For a long, long time, the maestro gazed upon this painting. He did not realize how long until the slanting beams of Tortinevra's tarnished sun had crawled away from the slanted window, leaving him abandoned in a room grown dark. At this, he took a sudden breath and shook his head, wiping dim tears from his faded cheek. He stood and flung the cover back across the painting. But even then, even when he closed his eyes, he saw Atiasi staring from the darkness of his own mind, mournful and accusing. When Dulce Mara returned that night, he found the maestro alone by the window of his atelier, lit by a lone candle in the red light of a crescent moon. Beyond him, the city's darkened spires pierced the night like hooks. Dulce Mara, come, fetch yourself a glass and drink with me. Drink with your maestro. He had a full glass before him and an empty bottle, and another bottle beside him wounded already. On the same table were several props which had been set up for a still-life vanitas, a skull, a bowl of grapes, a cup and dagger. With a small shrug, Dulcimara crossed the window and, seeing nothing else to drink from, plucked the goblet from beside the skull. It was already full, as he sat across from his master, the window's wide and red-rhymed arc framed them both. Saluti. Saluti, maestro. Their seats were at a distance. Their glasses could not reach to clink. Both drank. Maestro, said Dulce Mara, leaning forward as he wiped the purple from his lips. Are you sad? You seem not quite yourself. I've lost a pupil, Dulce Mara, and I have been surpassed. It took the maestro a moment to bring himself to say the next part. I saw your painting. You have produced a great work, Dulce Mara. It is sempiternal. The young man sat back. A flush came over his cheek, perhaps from the praise, perhaps from the wine. Then, you'll sponsor me as a free master. I'll be able to open a studio of my own. For a long moment, Kilsini merely stared at the floor beneath his velvet slippers. Then he looked up, and with sad eyes he met the apprentice's gaze. No, Dulce Mara, I will not. As he often did, the young man took this in silence. But he was no longer smiling. His eyes were dilated with the moonlight, and he was sitting quite straight and still, except for his chest. His chest was moving quickly. You've been a good pupil, Dulce Mara, Kilsini said, leaning back with a sigh. Maestro, Dulce Mara, I can give you that respect, at least. No, young maestro, it gives me nothing but pain to tell you this. But you have drank of the poisoned chalice. The young man's eyes went wide, and he lunged for the goblet. 
but no sooner had he reached it than he was racked by spasm that knocked the chalice aside and carried him forward to the hard, cold floor. Amidst a spreading pool of wine at his master's feet, he curled and writhed like a leech dripped in salt. Do you remember how I found you, Dulcimara? Kilsini said, how I took you in. Oh, say you remember, my Dulcimara, and forgive. Chapter 4 The Belladonna, O oh, Belladonna Dulcimara tried to speak. His face was dark, his eyes were red with blood. By the Lagos Venetia, Kilsini said. His wistful voice was filled with the sing-song cadence he had once used to lull a lost child to sleep, and now to longer slumbers yet. Where the belladonna grows, and touches the water themselves with its venom. And the sky behind me was dark itself as nightshade, but lit across the rim by Cheetah Malfi's dying embers. Oh! He shook his head and drained his cup to the lees. And to think, Dulke Mara, that I had all but given up my hopes of art. I was penniless before that, an impoverished apprentice, as you are. I had lost all faith. And then came the war, the sack, and I was walking home in the cool of night with a bag of the hardlit city silver at my thigh. I thought I might remain a soldier, if you can believe it. A soldier, Dulke Mara, for the easy cash. But then I came upon the Lagos Venetia, a oh, pool of history and myth, with its dark, cool waters and its fruited shores, the smell of it by night like bitter fruit. And I knew when I looked upon the skies reflected in its endless depth that I could never turn my back on art. And there I found you. Passed out from exhaustion by the waters, a lost peasant boy wandered close to the perils of a burning city. It was good you didn't reach there, Dulcimara, and better still, you didn't drink the waters. Otherwise, you would not have lived to be my first apprentice, my greatest work, my Dulcimara. A trembling hand clawed at the maestro's ankle, jerking him from wine-soaked reveries of times gone past of pools as dark as fruit, as dark as maiden's eyes, as dark as Chitamalfi's skies. It seemed almost to astonish him to see Dulcimara dying on the floor. Not dead yet, which was surprising, though the veins of his throat now stood out, very dark, and the maestro, with his artist's eye, could see the blood pulse through them at a hundred beats a minute. Not long now, he thought. Not long now, my son. You'll see me. It was remarkable that he could still speak, even in a strangled whisper. It filled Kilsini with a painful pride, his Dulcimara. Such resilience, only to be found in the soul of an artist. He leaned forward to accept the dying words. You're wrong. Wrong? What's wrong? I drank that night. From the pool. Don't be silly, my boy. He would have died. But the dying man shook his head, a wrenching, painful gesture. In Chitamalfi, we drink that poison from our mother's breast. It took a moment for the rush of insight to reach the maestro's sodden brain. The, the sketches, Solana, the, the poison cup. Too late, trembling hands seized him by the velvet robe and wrenched him to the floor. A momentary struggle and a crash, a table dragged over on its side, a still life disarrayed, grapes smeared across the floor, a skull cracking and bouncing to roll into half-darkness between the table legs, there to nestle unnoticed amongst its dust and shadows. Vanitas. And then, as the two strove, half seen in the darkness below the red-rhymed window, with a dagger between them like a shard of crimson moon, 
It seemed that the apprentice bent down over the master as if to kiss him on the mouth, and as he did, his black-stained lips went wide, and the black flood of poison rushed up from inside him, and the black vomit flowed down through the dry air, almost slowly, almost slithering more than falling into the maestro's open mouth. And some moments after that, Dolkemara stood, the unused knife still in his hand until he tossed it aside. Below him, the maestro writhed and curled up, like an insect dry upon the window sill. The veins of his throat now stood out, very dark, and Dulcimara, with his artist's eye, could see the blood pulse through them at a hundred beats a minute. Then, stillness, and silence in the studio. But Dulcimara couldn't hear it through the blood that pounded in his neck. He staggered from the atelier, and past the open cell doors where apprentices watched from shadowed rooms with gleams of avarice or dread or triumph in their eyes. Poison-stained, he floated down the winding stairs and found his own apartments full of dark. But he could see, more than ever before, the poison had opened his gaze, and his eyes were full dark. Absent any stars, he seized with darkened, streaming hands the gray cloth that shrouded up his masterwork, his great work, his prophecy. He tore the cloth aside. Before his eyes, his home was burning once again. He thought of the Sibyls of Tyrrheni. They prophesied and died. His mother with her wide, dark eyes, and how she had held him, just so, with triple arrows in her side, his father with his wide, dark eyes, lit up by candlelight as he filled the dark with devils in his temptation of Saint Chinidius. He tried to fill his eyes with a final look at the great work he had created, but the blackness had gone too black at last. The light was all out of focus, and at his vision's edge, the half-glimpsed things were swimming in the darkness. He heard a woman's footstep in the doorway, the smell of night like bitter fruit, and then the belladonna's arms around him. This week's episode, The Dagger or the Poisoned Chalice, was written by Alexander Saxton and performed by Anthony Botello. The Wrong Station is made possible with the generous support of our listeners on Patreon. Thank you to Penguin, Heather Ross, Camel Pope, Jeremiah Safford, and This Is A Thing for helping us keep the lights, well, off. You can also support us by leaving a rating and review on iTunes, or wherever it is you listen to The Wrong Station. The Wrong Station is co-produced by Alexander Saxton, Anthony Botello, and Jacob Duarte Spiel, with music composed and performed on the piano by Elan Citrin, and arranged for the viola and performed by Viola Schmidt. You can follow The Wrong Station on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and email us at therongstation at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>